In concept, Cop Rock resembles Dennis Potter's The Singing Detective, a work Bochco admires. But he says his idea for a musical cop show goes back to the days of his police series, Hill Street Blues. It was suggested to me somewhere, uh, third season, fourth season of Hill Street, that, that we take it to Broadway as a musical. And I loved that idea. I, I could see it, you know. Uh, I could see our characters and that set and everything on, on a Broadway stage. And for all kinds of reasons, it just simply wasn't feasible to do it. But the idea of, of, of cops and music, for some reason, just stuck in my brain. Uh, and and I, I became really uh, enamored of it. Dispatch. Cop Rock has obvious roots in the chaotic, overwhelmed, in the city world Bochco created more than a decade ago with Hill Street Blues. That series is credited with having virtually reinvented the TV cop show. The car. Oh, Ma, they stole my car. That's a brand new unit, second one today. I'll tell you something. If I have to shoot up this whole street, I'm going to get that car back. There ain't no way I'm going to file a report okay, on this. Okay, no way at all. Hey, Hill Street Blues showed police officers as imperfect beings, unable to keep the lid on a hostile world overflowing with unsolvable social problems. Let's just call in and get another unit. That phone! Look at this mess! Look at this! I always felt that, that it, was a, it was about a group of men and women holding despair at arm's length. You know, that, that everywhere you looked, it, it was a losing proposition. Uh, and, and yet somehow these people were charged with the responsibility of, of, of having to maintain some kind of order in, in the sea of chaos. Over the years, Bochco has become such an influential program maker that his work has been analyzed by a growing body of academics. David Mark at the Annenberg School for Communication regards the despair that Bochco documented in Hill Street Blues as a metaphor for the frustration many Americans felt towards liberalism in the 1970s. Well, you do get a, a, a sense of uh, the hopelessness of liberals. The, the, the clear liberal in the program is Joyce Davenport. Uh, she is the public defender, and she, her job is an impossible job. Uh, crisis management is what we have. We, we don't have anything uh, uh, like, uh, you know, great society optimism about programs changing things. And in a sense, um, Joyce's coming together with Frank Farilla, kind of centrist or uh, conservative centrist, the two of them come together to manage the endless crisis that the inner city has become. There's no hope about solving it. Uh, at the end of each episode, uh, they uh, go to bed together and uh, give each other a little solace. Uh, the camera goes dark. Uh, they get some relief from the horrors of the day, we, we find. But uh, no, no utopia. This is it. This is the permanent state of the, uh, of the inner city. It wasn't just its vision of society that made Hill Street Blues different. It also used a radically new storytelling technique. The series was crammed with a cast of 13 principal characters, brought together in episodes containing at least four different storylines. Scenes overflowed with activity and overlapping dialogue. Bochco made demands on the audience. Plots weren't neatly resolved each week. There weren't always happy endings. I need a ride home later on. The established rules of television drama were broken again in creating a distinctive visual look for Hill Street Blues. Handheld cameras and unconventional editing were combined to give Hill Street a congested, messy look to mirror the chaos of real life. In the roll call scenes, for example, I instructed the editors, contrarily to what we always do, to use the bad film and not use the good film. Every time the camera settled down and got reasonably into a close-up, an acceptable close-up, I would say, cut away, get, a get off of that now. This is a slight exaggeration, but we, what we tried to do is use all the junk, all the pans and the focusing and the misframings and all of that. We tried to use all of it, so again, out of this mess came these people. The, the handheld camera is something that you might see at uh, some underground uh, uh, film festival in New York. Uh, but was only seen on, on television in the midst of uh, a breaking news event, maybe. And to see this in a cop show, 
uh, that whole feel of the, uh, the shaky camera that went against all the slickness that uh, American television was based on, it, that caught people's eye. The Wall Street Journal discovered that the high end, the BMW crowd, was watching Hill Street Blues. And the demographics were very wealthy, top end people. It seemed to be appealing to exactly that audience that advertisers are most uh, enamored of, of reaching. So they were, getting, they were getting top dollar for their advertising minutes, you know, on Hill Street. What Bochco demonstrated with Hill Street Blues was that networks like NBC could make a lot of money from programming targeted not at a mass audience, but at a smaller, relatively high-income group. Bochco's skills in bringing in these viewers were becoming highly prized at a time when the networks were losing their mass audience to home video and the multitude of new cable channels that were opening up. Ultimately, Hill Street Blues helped NBC become not just the most popular network in America, but the number one network with class. All of us at NBC at the time wanted to be associated with, with the better product that Hill Street represented and St. Elsewhere and Cheers and certain other shows. And, and we did indeed sort of capture that title, and it, and it helped, so that eventually we were both good and popular, and that's a combination that you can't beat. Bochco's skill at reaching an upmarket audience really came into the fore with L.A. Law. This so-called designer courtroom drama has a look, characters, and stories crafted to appeal to the affluent young professionals of the late 80s. L.A. Law updated the familiar format of the TV law show with wit and glitz, and it quickly became a big commercial hit. Weddings always make me cry. Two to one, this marriage doesn't last a year. Sheila, I'm warning you. Might I suggest that since the two of you seem incapable of getting in the spirit of this occasion, you might take your leave now. And might I suggest that you are a totally, inconceivably pompous, self-important bag of wet brownies? Huh? Sheila, how could you say that to him? Because you don't have the courage to do it yourself. For 20 years, you've let him step all over you. He steps on you at the office, and then you come home and step on me. You're manufacturing this, Sheila. I'm sick of it, Douglas. I'm sick of you. I'm sick of your bald head and your hairy back. I'm sick of your three-piece suits and that stupid pocket watch of your father's. But most of all, I'm sick of your humiliating me with your sickening little affairs. My affairs? And who are you? The Virgin Mary? <laughs> L.A. Law was the uptown counterpart to the downtown Hill Street Blues. Um, these people were well-educated, they had money, they uh, were driven by different needs. Um, it was about power, it was about sex, it was about winning. Um, we wanted to put them in a clean, crisp environment, kind of hermetically sealed, as sealed up as, as, as Hill Street was loose and on the streets. Well, I always felt that LA Law was about winners. Uh, these, you know, upscale people you know, in sunny California, uh, optimis optimistic, uh, going to work every day in an arena in which there were winners and losers. Uh, and, 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 and they had an opportunity to, to win. Uh, and they did win a lot, you know, and, and they were successful. Uh, they, they had access to the good life in a, in, in, in a, in a way that none of those characters in Hill Street did. I also wanted to make it look, frankly, like the commercials that surrounded it. It became very apparent to me as, as we moved into the middle 80s that the commercials, a lot of the better commercials, looked and sounded better than the shows that were on the air. They had a kind of glistening silvery quality to them. and and the sound was sharp. And I set out to try and find that. But the content of L.A. Law was just as important as its look. Sex. Well, rape is just a little more serious than just sex. From his Hill Street Blues days, Bochco has doggedly battled with the network's nervousness over the shocking and controversial. His commercial track record has won him far greater freedom than many other producers. 
In LA law, his use this to include subject matter other TV programs might be reluctant to tackle. Bochco has touched on everything from the AIDS epidemic to sexual guilt among the mentally retarded. Did you ever physically touch any woman? No. Lily, you, 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 you told the police and you told us that you did something bad. What did you mean by that? I saw it. I saw sex. She was naked. They arrested you because they think you grabbed a girl and forced her to touch your penis. I did not. I did not. Rochko's work has the feel of realism, but some critics think that after Hill Street Blues, his drama veered increasingly towards fantasy. It's vivid. It's a heightened reality, but I don't think it's real at all. If it were real, I don't think that L.A. Law would be the blockbuster TV series that it is. I mean, he can jolt us, but, but he doesn't... Um, you don't care in the same way that you used to do about Hill Street Blues characters. Again, you know, I come back to that point. You can be shocked or titillated or intrigued, or you can want to watch it every week, genuinely want to watch it. But I haven't ever cried over an, uh, an L.A. Law episode. And I think that that's part of the reason it works so well as a TV series. It is not life. But for others, Bochco's softening of reality in shows like L.A. Law doesn't take away from his dramatic purpose. The message is that um, uh, to, the, to middle class people involved with their careers and so forth, that it is necessary to remain involved in social issues, no matter where you're going, that you will in fact be punished by Stephen Bochco if you are a, um, uh, you know, a yuppie or uh, uh, whatever, if you don't remember that the, the whole basis of society is the social involvement of the citizen. In cop rock, Bochco may have gone overboard with fantasy. For many viewers, a musical cop show pushed the boundaries of popular TV drama too far. The series was a commercial failure in America. He's gonna try it one too many times. Ultimately, what did it in is that people simply rejected the notion of, of marrying a dramatic television show about cops to music. Uh, I, think, I think if cop rock had been a musical theatrical event, it probably would have done a lot better. Uh, but I think in, in, in the sort of intimacy of, of one's own home, you know, where, where you watch television and you, I don't know, you know, you pick your toes or, you know, whatever you do when you're <laughs> sitting there alone watching TV. I, I, I think suddenly seeing characters break into song uh, was embarrassing. No cop ever stands alone. That's for certain. That's for certain. When you're in trouble, you got brothers I think of Cop Rock as Hill Street Blues on LSD. Uh, maybe using his, uh, a bit of his, uh, the credit that he had uh, uh, bought for himself through the good work and the successful commercial work that he had done to do, to do an experiment. Uh, I think that that's fine, that there's not nearly enough of that. I wish, w you know, uh, certainly we see so many failures each year. I wish that at least a tenth of those failures were failures because of the reasons that Cop Rock was a failure, as opposed to just being a bad imitation of the Cosby Show, as opposed to being uh, a good one. Um, had that worked somehow, uh, you know, he would have been a genius again. Uh, but uh, I, I think that uh, he can't be accused of uh, the worst aspect of mass culture, which is to find the middle, not the lowest common denominator, but to find the middle and endlessly reproduce it. I accomplished exactly what I wanted to accomplish with, with Cop Rock. I'm really, really grateful that I got an opportunity to do it. Uh, I'll always be happy with it. You know, I think there were things we could have done better and whatever, but 
but I, but I loved it. I loved the experience. It's the most fun I ever had doing a show. Uh, and so I'll never look upon it as, as a failure. Won't you hire more police? We want out at night. It's not safe to walk the streets even when it's light. I want you should do something about all the violent crime. Take, Take a, a careful, careful look, look at it. Tom Brook reporting, and you can see Cop Rock on BBC One on Monday nights, and Channel 4 is currently showing LA Law every Thursday.